This is a print in place mechanical iris. Even if you've never seen one before, you get the point of what a mechanical iris is. But this one is print in place, which means that when you print it on your printer, all you have to do is pick it up, give it a couple moves, and it's fully assembled and ready to go. I'm gonna be dumping a bunch of information in this video, so if you just wanna jump straight to stuff you want, go down to the description below. You'll find links to the files, You'll find some affiliate links down there that help me out if you click on them. And then you'll also find a table of contents so you can jump straight to what you want. So what am I gonna be showing you? Well, first I'm gonna show you the overall design process I went through to create this whole thing. Just a quick overview showing you, you know, how I went about coming up with how it should be designed in the first place. Then I'll show you two different tips for print in place that were used for this. Two different uh, kind of applications of print in place methods that were used in this. One is the vertical hinging and another is the horizontal surfaces in this as well. Then I'm gonna take you through some kind of frustrations and complaints I have with this design and with working in Fusion 360. It's not necessarily Fusion's fault. You'll see what I mean. Um, and that will be it. That'll be the entire video. So again, go down to the description below for a table of contents, or just stay tuned. So if you know me already, you know I love mechanical irises. I've made a bunch of them out of wood. I designed a bunch of crazy mechanical ones out of plastic, but I've never done print and place ones. Lately, I've been on a kick learning print and place stuff and challenging myself to do more complicated things. My print and place uh, unscrewy box thing was pretty cool. Um, but I wanted to make a standard mechanical iris that opened with horizontal motion as print in place. This was a challenge I set on myself. Nobody's asking for this. Um, but I thought it would be a cool, complex thing to design. And I really wanted to see if I could pull it off. So let me just walk you through the design in Fusion 360 and kind of my whole process going through it. Here in Fusion 360, we have the final result of the design. Now this looks a little bit different than the ones you've seen printed or the one you find uh, on printables.com and we'll get to that later. That's because there are some problems with this latest iteration that I just haven't felt like fixing. So let's actually go through the process of designing it. You can see there's some, some major, uh, there's only about four different components to this whole thing and then some of those you know, are multiple instances, but there's only maybe four major components. Let's go through the entire design process. I'm just gonna hit play here and narrate this as it goes. So I started with a drawing of a mechanical iris and I started building up the leaves themselves. Uh, those leaves then I added the pins in the motion section that was gonna push the leaves back and forth. Here I'm just kind of establishing where all my vertical chunks are gonna be. So then I added this outer ring, which pushes the, uh, those pushers to move the leaves. And then I have a base plate as well that stays stationary that acts as a pivot. You can see I'm adding chamfers on everything here. I know I'm blasting through this, just bear with me. I'll dig into some more of this in a little bit. You can see I'm adding chamfers to everything here and that's to help capture things so that whenever you pull it off the plate, it doesn't just pull into pieces. So here you, you'll notice this bottom plate is missing. It's just barely there. And that's because I had to cut away sections everywhere where there'd be a moving part so that nothing would interfere with the motion. Here I've added the handles, going back and repairing some of these chamfers I messed up. And then here we are getting to um, cutting away even more. So then I throw all the pieces, all the instances in there so that I can look at it. At this point in time, I've done some test prints to see how it's gonna work. Uh, and I found that it was kind of flimsy, you know, so it needed some additional support, which I will add momentarily. So here I am, I'm still adding chamfers around everything. I wanted chamfers on stuff so that everything just kind of meshes together and doesn't pull apart once you pull it off of the bed. There's a chamfer, you know, thinner and thicker parts on this whole thing. So here I am adding the support to that base piece to make the whole thing more rigid and a chamfer on that. And that really is where that design ends for what you see uploaded. Here are a few more steps I'll go into later that had some problems, uh, like I didn't notice some parts were fused and then some other parts got messed up. We'll get into that 
later. But that was the basic design process. Let me end this um, playback and we will look at the final product so I can show you a little bit of what I mean. You can see the design here, like there's chamfers here that allow me to get to different areas in printing. You can see the pins all start printing at the same time. There's like a foot touching everywhere, no matter what. So there's the design, bottom to top. We'll go through here real quick the major components. Let me hide all these duplicates. The major components, there's only four. Let me hide some things here and we'll start from the order I designed them in. That's the leaf. That's the part that moves. You can see here it's got a captive pivot here and a pivot pin here. This is going to be stationary. This is going to be moving. Attached to that leaf, we have a leaf arm. Now this leaf arm is completely floating. It's not attached to anything permanently. You have a pin here and a pin here that are captive in other parts that move, so it floats freely. We have the outer ring, which is the topmost part, which you can see pushes this leaf arm and has a handle. And then we have the bottom plate. The bottom plate holds the pivot point of this leaf still and is kind of captive within this outer ring so it doesn't fall apart. The bottom plate doesn't even touch the, uh, the leaf pushing arm here, you can see. That bottom plate is interesting because it actually ends up on the top of everything else as well. So here's that bottom plate alone. It's on the bottommost and topmost parts. I didn't need these bridges up here. They're just there to make it a little bit more solid, make it feel more solid and rigid in your hand. So here is a vertical hinge that allows this leaf to rotate right here. And these are present all over this model. There's one here, one here, and one here. And we're gonna take a peek at these so you can see how they're designed. They're actually extremely easy. I could even just design one here instead of, um, instead of doing this. Here, let's just take a peek here. We'll do a uh, section analysis. Cross view here. And let's move this here to this pin. There we go. So let's look at this pin. We can see here that the bottom foot, oh, there's one of my problems right there. Look at that, it's not completely level with the ground. The bottom foot here is wider than the hole that it goes through, so it's not gonna pull through, and the top is wider than the hole, so it's not gonna pull through. And then there's a gap all the way around this, so it's not touching. If your printer is decently dialed in, a half a millimeter at any place will be a plenty of space. This is actually too much. I accidentally added too much of a gap here, so you can see it's a little bit loose and wiggly. Um, and that is one of the complaints that I have we'll get back to later. But you can see that this is just a basic, there's just a gap here, and then it's wider at the bottom and top than the actual hole so that it won't pull through. And that, you know, you have a matching chamfer here and here on the hole itself. Let's look at the others. So you can see it's, it's exactly the same thing, just repeated over and over. So here's this other one here. There's a gap. That looks like a more reasonable gap. That's probably about a half a millimeter right there. It's wider at the bottom, wider at the top, matching chamfer on the bottom and the top of the hole. Same thing, same process. No need for anything else, nothing special considered. A half a millimeter gap works on any vertical surface to make a pen. And you can get really precise with that. Some printers can get down to like 0.2 millimeters as a gap, um, but I kind of leave mine a little loose because a lot of people's printers aren't as dialed in as they think they are and they will complain like it's your fault when their printer uh, does not successfully print your model. And then here's the third one, which is exactly the same thing. Oh, this one's definitely, so that's just a half millimeter. And you can see how tight that is. Maybe a, maybe a whole millimeter there. I think that's just a half millimeter. That may even be less there. But you can see here that central pen, very visible here, is wider at the top and bottom than those. That's how you can do vertical print in place pens or hinges. 
The second print in place principle used in this is, I mean, in short, it's just, it's just bridging. Um, you know, if, if we look here, let me unhide everything or well, let's keep it simple here. If we go here, we can find some spots where there are parts that are just simply bridged over each other. Here we go. So this is stationary right here. Let me zoom way in. This section here is stationary and this section moves in the final design. And there's just a gap here. And I've found just like the vertical pins, if you give yourself a half millimeter gap, sometimes down to 0.2 millimeters, you have to test on your machine, but if you do a half millimeter, it'll work. If you give yourself a half millimeter gap, those two pieces will snap loose and move freely above each other. Now, if you give yourself space for your printer to bridge, if you give yourself two surfaces that are not round, bridging over round surfaces sucks, uh, you know, give yourself parallel lines to bridge across, your printer can bridge fairly far. I think, you know, a standard Bruce off the shelf can do like one and a half, two inches of a bridge without issue. Um, so you can actually bridge pretty far distances here. You can see this leaf is bridged right across here. No problems at all. My initial tests, I did the entire leaf bridged. Uh, more or less and I was able to snap it free and move it Now there was a lot of friction because you know there's a little bit of drooping and it's rubbing uh, so on this design you know about half of this leaf that has to move is is down below and then it you know uh, it touches the bed and then it comes up on this angle here so there's only a little bit of a bridge so drooping would be minimized but like these bridges up here on my printer these bridges have no problem at all. I printed these on the Prusa Mini and the Prusa Mark 3S. And this bridge up here on the top has no problem whatsoever. The bridges that did have problems were these right here where this is a curved surface. So bridging over a curved surface is going to give you problems because it's moving the nozzle in a curve, but there's nothing to hold the filament there in a curve. So it bridges like from this corner to over here, wherever the curve uh, it's going to be adjusted to. Um, but yeah, the second point is just freaking bridge stuff. Like, look at this bridge here. You would think, if you had never tried it, that this would not work for print in place. These two pieces move freely and smoothly away from each other. But you might be tempted to think that this piece right here would fuse with the part below it. However, this bridge here is nothing for your 3D printer. And even if it wasn't, leaving a little 0.5 millimeter gap is enough that it can break free uh, and move. It'll just have a little bit more friction than using a bridge. Okay, now time for my frustrations. Um, this is not a complaint about Fusion 360. If anything, I'm complaining about myself and my disorganized nature, though I do believe a feature in Fusion 360 could help. What I found was, if you compare the model that's on Thingiverse now, versus the final model that I came up with, what you'll see is that the final model is much sloppier, much looser. And what I think happened is I went through and I was adjusting some of these vertical hinges right here. I was trying to get as much of the foot of this design onto the print bed as possible to ensure better prints for people with less you know, perfect bed adhesion. And somewhere I was adjusting these. And the way that these worked is I would adjust one and apply that adjustment using an array within Fusion. That's, you know, if you go up here, let's say I, I wanted to add a little chamfer right there. I would then add the chamfer in one spot, but use an array to spread it all the way around. But what I found was I created those pins using an array. And then I came back two days later and I made an adjustment to the pin using an array, but I think I made an adjustment to a, the, a different pin than I used to create it. So then that adjustment was like somehow multiplied on that one single pin. So what you'll find is you go through, if you look at this thing, you'll find like one leaf is super loose, but the others are fine in one spot. And then on another pin, you have the same thing where just like one of them is very loose, but then the others are fine. And I think that's because I was coming back making adjustments to a different section than I initially used to create the array. And when I create an array from that, then it, it like compounds the uh, problem on the one that I started with. So if there was some way that Fusion could read my mind and know that what I'm looking for is the original one, that would be awesome. 
Um, but there's no way, of course, for Fusion to be able to read my mind. So I guess I'm complaining that Fusion isn't psychic, you know, uh, to be fair, that's, that's uh, not their fault. Thank you for joining me. Uh, of course, I want to thank my patrons who support me in this as well as the controller project that uh, is a side project I do where I make controllers for people, video game controllers for people with physical disabilities. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you on the next video.